Good evening. Welcome to Lompoc City Council meeting. This is Tuesday, November 21st, 2017. Um, if I can remind everyone, if you have not done so already, please silence your cell phones. Madam Clerk, could we have roll call, please? Councilmember Vega? Here. Councilmember Starbuck? Present. Councilmember Osborne? Here. Mayor Pro Tem James Mosby? Present. Mayor Bob Lingle? Here. Uh, let's see. Oral community. No, we don't have that. We. <laughs> We did that already. City Attorney, reports taken in uh, closed session. Any action? Thank you, Mayor. There were two items. Um, both were discussed. No reportable action on the first item. And on the second item, um, the City Council accepted the City Manager's resignation and agreed the uh, mutual agreement that it would be effective January 5th. And the Council also directed staff to um, start down the path of hiring a um, firm, a recruitment firm, to do a nationwide search for a, uh, an additional, a new city manager, as well as start a process for um, selecting an interim by doing some internal discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, please rise for an invocation by Reverend Mike Cook. And is, okay. Pastor Bruni, of course. Thank you, Oh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. Well, dear God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your mercies and your grace to us. And in this season of Thanksgiving, help us to pause to give you thanks for the beauty of our city, the wonder of our country, and the beauty and grace that we find in each other. I pray that you give our mayor and our council wisdom tonight as they deliberate the matters of our city. Continue to watch over and protect our police and our fire, those who watch over us. We ask for your special grace upon those who've recently lost loved ones in our community. And we pray that you would give them your mercy and your grace and your peace. And God, before I, I close this prayer out, I'd also like to ask you to guide and bless and watch over our military who keep us safe, especially those downrange and in harm's way. And so thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings to us in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and Thank you, and please have a seat. Okay, we have a couple presentations. Uh, first is uh, Candace Koff. She's a chairperson of the City of Lompoc's Central Safety Committee. She's gonna be presenting the Quarterly Above and Beyond Awards. Thank you. Um, Mayor, Council, staff, and citizens, it is my honor as the chair of the City of the Lompoc Central Safety Committee to present the first quarter above and beyond words for the 2017-2018 year. Nominations are made by peers for activities that are viewed as above and beyond the requirements of the job. The first nomination was Marcy Webb in Finance. She was recognized for working for the City of Lompoc for 32 years and she has never had an injury. Next was Peter Almada and for Gilberto Ramirez, they're both from Collections. They're both being recognized for helping a disoriented woman near the recycle area of the V Street Collection Yard. She was lost for hours and they called the police department to get her a ride home. Another recognition goes to Ashley Winslow, the supervisor for the Aquatic Center. Ashley was concerned about the location of cooling stations for the city during heat events after having to close the Aquatic Center during one such event due to the capacity. Because of this, Ashley wanted to be able to direct patrons to the other sites that provide cooling on high heat days. Both Sam Fast and Lido Tabin from Facilities are being recognized for their extra effort and their aid to a fellow coworker. This coworker had debris fall from the light fixtures in her office area, and Sam and Lido not only cleaned up the debris, but they also replaced burnt out bulbs in the area. Marcy Webb, Ruth Porbog, and 
Margie Hammond, all from finance, were recognized for participating in a walking program during their lunch break. Additionally, all three promote healthy habits during, within the workplace. And lastly, Amabel Apollorino from HR is recognized for providing employee support during the annual benefit enrollment for city employees. A coworker nominated Amabel and when she provided her historical information within hours of her request. This concludes the nomination of the first quarter nominations. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to be uh, reading a proclamation um, recognizing, I guess it's November, as, uh, November? Yes, as uh, Lung Cancer Awareness Month. This may be a little bit tough on me. Both my parents passed away from lung cancer. So this is the City of Lompoc Proclamation, Lung Cancer Awareness, Awareness, Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in both men and women in every ethnic group in the United States. And whereas, lung cancer takes the lives of more Americans each year than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. And whereas, 427 Americans die each day of lung cancer. And whereas, former smokers and people who have never smoked comprise nearly 80% of new cancer cases lung cancer cases each year. Whereas nearly 80% of new lung cancer cases will be diagnosed at late stages. And whereas lung cancer screening for those at high risk using low dose CT scans is recommended and needs to be implemented across the country. And whereas funding for lung cancer research falls far short of what it, of what it, is, of what it needs and it's a for this very fatal disease. Whereas Lung Cancer Alliance is dedicated to serving and listening to those living with and at the risk of lung cancer to reduce the stigma, improve quality of life, and increase survival. Now therefore, I, Bob Lingle, Mayor of City of Lompoc, California, do hereby proclaim the month of November 2017 as Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Um, the proclamation pretty much lays out the grim statistics about lung cancer. Um, hopefully with the recent developments of targeted and immunotherapies being used now, it will increase the five-year survival rate from 1.7 out of 10 to something more comparable to breast cancer, which is 9 out of 10 survive for five years. And it's important to note that lung cancer is a disease that no one deserves, and they des uh, lung cancer people, uh, people dealing with lung cancer deserve the same compassion that is given to other people dealing with cancer diagnosis. And Lung Cancer Alliance offers a variety of support services through their website, educational materials, mobile app, and their toll-free helpline. So um, that's what's helped our family get through a lung cancer diagnosis, and if you know someone who has lung cancer, direct them to Lung Cancer Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> City Manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to quickly discuss a couple items that are somewhat intertied, so bear with me. First of all, one question is uh, to poll the council as to whether or not um, they would like to have the January 2nd meeting canceled or not. And the other issue will be whether or not um, there's a desire to have City Hall and other non-24-7 operations closed for the entire Christmas week. If you'll remember during our budget deliberations, we talked about promoting some um, voluntary furloughs and one of the ways we might be able to accomplish this is by closing for the, for the week between Christmas and New Year's. Right now that week is already has Monday and Tuesday designated as observable holidays by 
the city. And so we're really talking about the Wednesday through Friday period that would either normally be open or could be closed if um, you were you were to direct that or indicate your possible approval of that. If you're inclined to consider that, we would bring that back to a um, to a, a meeting, probably the next meeting on the fifth, to have you formalize your position on that. And we'd also need to talk with the impacted employee organizations uh, to meet and confer with them over uh, that issue, but we'd be able to accomplish that in a fairly uh, short time frame. So one, for budgetary savings purposes, one question is, uh, are you open or would you prefer to have the, uh, the city hall open or closed for those three days, uh, December 27th, 28th, and 29th? Uh, and the, the caveat and how it relates to January 2nd meeting is it just about assures that if we do close it, that we're also going to have to cancel the January 2nd meeting just because we would, we're already challenged to put together an agenda for the January 2nd meeting given the immediate preceding holidays and would really close out our opportunity to be able to, to put one together. So they really are two different questions, but they, they are intertied. So I'd start by asking maybe about council's uh, feelings about Christmas week. Would you rather have city hall and other non-24 hour operations um, ceased during that entire week or we, do you wish to have those remain o open and active for the three days of that week? So does anyone have any questions for Mr. Weimiller on this issue? House Mayor Mosby. My biggest concern would be potentially people having to pay their utility bills. Is there some way you would lead way before or after so they're not able? I mean, that, that would be my biggest question. Right, uh, and recognizing that if we close, we really do need to close it. If we just open for one particular purpose, we probably should just be open for all of them, um, whether, whether it's our permit counters or the utility payment counters or whatever. Is there a way that you could bump a layer of leniency if they were delinquent on that day and they couldn't get here? Is there a way that you could do that without a level of difficulty? Yes. And that would be my, I would be willing to do that if you were able to do that for the, the utilities. Any other questions? Okay, so instead of putting anyone on the spot, uh, going down the line, why don't we just um, vote a yes or a no on this? Uh, the green will be yes, red will be no. Okay. Okay, we'll bring that back on December 5th to formalize that with you with an, uh, you know, so that we properly noticed and get it on the agenda to do that. So part and parcel with that then, I'm assuming that everyone's good with the cancellation of the, the meeting that would be regularly scheduled for January 2nd. That's correct. We and that I can handle administratively without bringing that back. Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, Mr. Weimler, I was just going to make comment here that looking at the future council agenda items, there is nothing listed for the January 2nd meeting anyhow, so I don't think that there's not a problem with that. Right. Okay. So yeah. by your general consent, my plan will be to cancel the, to to post a cancellation for that. Thank you. Th and then finally, I just want to thank you for um, not only your consideration uh, as we discuss the, uh, what, what would be my final date here, but thank you for the opportunity to have worked here and served here for the last four years. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I can say that we have definitely appreciated you. And we'll miss you. Okay. Public comment on the consent calendar. Deb Andrews, Mission Hills. Best wishes to our departing city manager. This mayor and council have a unique opportunity to alter the direction and budget of City Hall with the hiring of a new city manager. I urge you to recruit someone from outside the system who would analyze which city services could be privatized at a cost savings. 
Please consider an individual who has the will, expertise, and backbone to review all facets of city government and make changes where appropriate to eliminate or reduce positions, departments, rules, ordinances, or initiatives unrelated to health, safety, or the purpose for which city government was created. During this deliberative process, please take the time to review Sandy Springs, Georgia city government. With a population of just over 100,000, Sandy Springs has eight employees, in addition to police and fire safety personnel. Sandy Springs rebid all their general services. As a result of this public-private partnership, Sandy Springs, Georgia has realized lower costs, higher performance, and a greater degree of accountability. Our current budget path is not sustainable, and some services provided were unsatisfactory. Please search for an individual committed to serving the citizens of Lompoc efficiently, effectively, and at less cost. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now just as a reminder, this is on the consent calendar. So anything, that's, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Um, anyone on the consent calendar? Good evening, Council. John Lane Lompoc, resident. First, I would ask you to move, remove item number six from the consent calendar. But just in case you don't, I'm going to tell you why, because I won't have a second chance. Those of you who are on the Council will recall that the purpose of the November 1, 2011 effort was the new GASB 54 accounting standard. Now, staff didn't tell the council that the adoption of the new policy would invalidate the 1994 council resolution controlling the use of the economic uncertainty fund. There was no discussion from the council about altering the 1994 council resolution. Current interpretation is that three seemingly unrelated portions of the 17-page document, when considered in total, remove council control of the fund. And I believe that interpretation is correct. What is not correct is that the city attorney and the finance director failed to tell the council in 2011 what the effect of the action would be. But perhaps they missed it too, and in a later reading, it became obvious. So there's a simple solution today, and that is for this council to make a motion to schedule an agenda item that will move the fund from the un so I'm move the economic uncertainty fund from the category of assigned fund balance to the category of committed fund balance with the same conditions as those in 1994. The other thing that's in my mind missing in this reserve compliance report that the city, the city attorney completed is it really doesn't talk about the other portion of that 2011 effort. And those of you who are on the council will recall that the other portion of it was to establish a reserve policy meeting the GASB 54, I think generally called GASB, requirements. And if you took an opportunity as I did to go back and read it, because I didn't really want to admit I'd made a mistake until I saw it, um, there are very specific criteria to establish that reserve and it goes bit by bit, and then there's a total. Now, I mean, back then it was $4.556 million. It, today it would probably be somewhat similar, um, but our reserves today aren't that similar. And what I gave you shows my guesstimate, and I did it based on a projection, of where we might be today. Back in June, we were $1.6 million upside down without the Economic Uncertainty Fund, today we could be 5.4. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Consent calendar. Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to close uh, public comment on the consent calendar, bring it back to the council. Now, the consent calendar consists of items that are generally considered routine unless an item is pulled by a council member. Does any council member wish to pull an item? Okay. Uh, 
Mr. Garcia, you have a correction you want to make to one of the items. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor Lingle, members of the council, mem uh, citizens and our citizens watching. There is a correction that I'd like to read and um, hand out to um, the, sorry, for, uh, number four, the consent agenda item number four, which is um, attached to uh, resolution number 614417 and it's exhibit C. So the correction was posted on the website. Um, inadvertently, the dispatch supervisor was listed twice in fiscal year 1819, and the police records uh, property supervisor was omitted. So we added that in and struck the duplicate. So we just handed out that uh, correction. And that again, that's uh, exhibit C of resolution number 614417. Thank you. OK, thank you. Okay, Councilor Mosby. I'd like to pull item number four. Okay, um, we're gonna pull item number four. Anyone else? Oh, Councilor Osborne. Um, I don't wish to pull the item, but I would like our city attorney to explain what the response for the public is for item number six, just a brief explanation, given it was a public request and did call out behavior by our city manager and our finance department. And as the results are part of a process, I think it's only fair that at least a statement be publicly made about that result. Certainly. Um, the direction that um, my office was given was to review several um, policies that are set up by resolutions and also other documents as well as looking at um, previous council meetings and seeing whether or not there was any um, violations of those policies by the city manager or the finance director, management services director, and the report indicates that there was no violation. Thank you. Anything else? Councilman Mosby. Yeah, I'd like to pull number six for further discussion. Okay, we're gonna pull item number four and item number six. And those items will be um, dealt with separately just prior to the second oral communication. Okay. Excuse me. Anything else? Okay, with, so with the correction, and with the exception of items number four and six, do I have a motion to accept the remainder of the consent calendar? I'll move. And do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5-0. Okay, we're gonna move on to staff presentations. No staff presentations, okay. Oral communications, this is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes on any item that can come before this council. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Leon Nutrika, and I'm here to make a pitch for and provide you with information regarding a unique property that's ideally situated to take advantage of this newly legalized uh, cannabis uh, law. Uh, the property is owned by the Denholm Corporation, the flower seed company, and they've owned this property since 1940, and up until recently have produced flower seeds uh, at this location. The property is 3.3 acres in size. It's completely fenced and uh, topped with bobbed wire. Uh, on site, existing on site are seven greenhouses totaling 35,000 square feet. There's a weather station on site. There's uh, a reverse osmosis water treatment system with a 5,000 gallon holding tank. Excuse me. Uh, there's uh, a 9,600 square foot warehouse, uh, 2,000 square feet of which is refrigerated and designed to maintain a temperature of 40 degrees. There's an office building on site that's been 
recently remodeled and upgraded to meet the uh, handicap standards. And, uh, uh, and I, watch, I would like you to consider this property uh, to be included in the uh, cannabis business zone. Uh, there is one problem with the property, and I'll bring that to your attention, you're probably aware of it, and that is that it's within 600 feet of uh, John uh, Manville Park, which I think has been designated a youth center. But I would argue that A Street, being four lanes of traffic in that area, and railroad tracks with no uh, intersections, pedestrian crosswalks, acts as a buffer zone separating the park from the Den Home property. So uh, I'm asking you to con consider putting this property within the, uh, the zone of uh, commercial cannabis activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so I think what he's talking about, it, it's the greenhouses on A Street, so. That's, that's correct, yes? It is the greenhouses on A Street. That's okay, yeah. Okay, anything else, oral communication? Seeing no one rise, we're gonna close oral communication and go to, going to public hearing item number seven, a public hearing regarding uh, transition to district-based elections and review of the draft restriction maps. Before we start with this, has everyone in the here had a chance to review these maps? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is our continued discussion that you've been having for several meetings about uh, transitioning your at-large elections to the district elections. Um, this hearing is to give you another opportunity and the community to view all the maps that are being, have been proposed to date and to start focusing on whether you think there's some maps there that you uh, have more preference to. And um, then we'll move on to the December 5th meeting, which will be another public hearing, and hopefully we'll have, an introduce, have you introducing an ordinance to modify the election process in Lompoc. And tonight we have um, our consultant here, uh, Justin Levitt, who's going to walk us through the process as has been done in a couple of other meetings. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Justin Levitt, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight to present on this issue. Um, just as we were talking about, this is the fourth of five required public hearings, the last one of which is December 5th. Um, these, these new districts will take effect for the 2018 election, and they'll be used in the 2020 election as well. In 2021, we will be getting new census data and the districts will have to be redrawn to reflect new population or new population changes since then, um, since 2010. Um, and I can talk about that later on um, as we go through the criteria as well. The number one criteria we used in the preparation of draft maps required by law, required by the Supreme Court, is that districts should be more or less equal in terms of total population. Uh, each district must contain about um, the same number of total residents as each other district. There's a deviation maximum difference between the largest and smallest district of 10%. That gives you a little bit of flexibility to keep communities together. However, we can't go above that 10% number. In addition, we have to meet the criteria of the Fed following the Federal Voting Rights Act. The Federal Voting Rights Act says that race cannot be used as the primary criterion. Um, but it must be one of many different criteria we use in the preparation of draft maps. Specifically, it talks about language minorities, groups that have had historic difficulty in obtaining ballot materials in their language. That brings the Latino population in under that, according to several Supreme Court decisions going back to the 1970s. Um, in addition, we look at traditional districting criteria and this is where we really want to focus the conversation because you know your communities better than I do. Um, and we see we have nine maps from the public here today in addition to two NDC drafts, um, all, of, all of which except one meet the basic standards and requirements um, in terms of equal population and keeping each district whole and contiguous. Um, 
the rest of this is up to the council to make the decisions and, and to the residents of the city to make the decisions about which set of communities of interest, which sets of neighborhoods and shared issues and shared problems makes the most sense for your city. Um, in terms of the Voting Rights Act analysis that we did, we did identify that there's a heavily Latino neighborhood in the central part of Lompoc. Um, and so that's kind of in the red, you can see there in the center of the city above. Um, we, to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act requirement, we recommend that you do not dilute this neighborhood um, in, in any way to keep that population together. We have received um, a grand total of 11 maps at this point, nine from the community, um, as well as two NDC drafts. Um, all but one of these 11 maps are contiguous and population balanced. There are three maps, 106, 107, and 111, that lack a district where Latinos are the majority of eligible voters as measured by citizen voting age population data. Um, and so that's gonna be, a, that, that goes back to this issue of vote dilution and breaking apart that neighborhood. Um, if you were to go with one of those maps, we would say that we need to hear very strongly the rationale for why you're doing that and why you're selecting it over a map that keeps that neighborhood together. Um, in terms of the different maps, we've kind of grouped them based on a lot of their features. Uh, many maps have a central district too, um, or three, as, in these, as it is in these maps, um, and three districts kind of along the sides of the city. In these particular maps, 102 and 103, we have one district in the northeast, one district in the northwest, and one district that includes the whole southern portion of the city. In 106 and 107, on the other hand, we have three vertical districts. So we have one northern tier district and then three that go all the way down to the southern, border, the southern part of the city. Um, even though these may be more compact, they do raise the issue of dividing that central community, um, Latino community in the central part of the city. Um, 101 and 105 offer um, no central district. These are the two maps that do not have a clear central neighborhood, uh, but divide the central part up into the three areas. Um, in 101, for example, we have a southern district and a northeast and a north central district. Whereas in 105, we have sort of a southeast, or southwest, northwest, and eastern area. Um, 108, 104, or 104, 108, and 109, I'll keep them in numerical order, create a central district and an eastern district, and then one district that's in the southwest. Um, so in 104, this is district three in the center, and 108 and 109, it's district two. But if you ignore the numbering, you'll see that district, the purple district or pink district at the eastern edge of 104 looks very similar to the eastern district in 109, as does the southern district in those two maps, even though the numbering is slightly different. Finally, we were, these are the two new maps that we've received. Uh, map 110 is not population balanced. It's not been available here because it's not a legal map for you to consider, but we did want to acknowledge receipt of it and explain why 110 is missing from our sequence of maps here. And then 111 is a very different concept um, that kind of divides the central neighborhood up between areas three and four, um, almost on a block by block basis. And the net effect of 111, we can look at the summary statistics. Um, is that it creates um, the highest Latino seat at 45%. Um, 106 and 107 each at a very similar percentage, while the rest of the maps each have a majority Latino seat. Um, and this is by eligible voters. So it's not just the voting age population, it's the citizen voting age population. Um, this is the number the courts tell us is one to consider for Voting Rights Act determinations. When we look at that deviation number, we'll see that 110 is highlighted as being 18.2% over, so over 10%. Um, the others are all under 10%. 101, uh, however, is 9.5%, so that's very close to 10%, but it's still under that legal maximum. Um, in terms of pairing current members of the council, uh, the first four maps each pair um, at least one set of members 
102, 103, and 104 pair two sets. The remainder of the maps, with the exception of 110, do not have pairings. Um, in addition to the maps we have here today, we also encourage you to take a look at these maps online. We have an interactive web viewer where you can search for addresses, schools, locations. Um, it'll zoom in and out into the different uh, neighborhoods and communities within your city. It allows you to switch plans on and off, um, and it will be available throughout this process. Um, now, these maps are really the beginning of this part of the discussion. Uh, we still have a chance to make changes or new maps over the next few days. Um, maps do have to be available to the public seven days before your next public hearing. Um, so that means that we'd be looking at getting anything new uploaded the week after Thanksgiving. Uh, we recommend with so many maps that we really try to narrow it down to maybe you know two to three concepts that um, are represent the different choices because we have a lot of very similar maps. Um, and so maybe tonight looking at narrowing this down to um, a number that we can really focus in on at the last meeting. Um, and besides that, we're really here to answer questions and take whatever feedback we get from the member, from the public as well as from the council. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, let's open. Councilor Mosley, did you have a negative question? <coughs> Does 101 dilute the Hispanic or Latino district? 101 does not. When you when you look at the percentages up there, I think the district had what a high 75. But you see, you made his comment that not to divide the that area. And when you look at the map, it looks to me like there's a a level where three comes into two and divides that that high population. If you now maybe not numbers, but when you see the mm -hmm the highest areas and neighborhoods there, it seems to divide that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, and that could be, that, that, that's part of, that goes right into the communities of interest question, and is that a, an appropriate line to divide that neighborhood? Uh, 101 creates a second highest Latino district at 47%. So while it only has one district that's technically a majority, it has two districts that are very close to a majority, uh, or a second district that's very close to a majority, and so does that outweigh dividing up this particular neighborhood? Um, you know, none of the other maps have this situation where you have a second district that's also very close to 50% as well. And so we know that there have been other jurisdictions that have argued that having two districts, even if they're not the highest percentage in one seat, if it allows you to raise the percentage substantially in a neighboring seat, that that could that could be a choice that the council makes. Um, and the choice is different from diff for every city. So if, if that is something, that, that's just an argument, we would say that that's how you would justify 101. But you could also justify another map that keeps that neighborhood together by saying that that community needs to stay together. Um, that 51% is not going to be the most effective Latino representation. Um, a seat that's of a higher percentage might do a better job. And I think it's important when you look down, you look at the voter turnout numbers when you see that and you, you reduce that significantly a, as well. When, and then when you see the total number, not just the percentage that came out, but when you see the total numbers, you, you kind of, you, you, you've got uh, one district that has 30, almost 3,500 and the smallest would have 1,900. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have a, a difference in that movement and the number of people coming out um, in, and that was in through November, yeah, voter turnout. The latest we have in there is from 2014, I believe. Yeah, no, that was, yeah. Um, I don't know, could you put map number one back up? Okay, you see what I'm talking about, where three comes into two when it's the furthest west, and it seems to really divide um, a neighborhood of, of interest and such is one of the things I think we weren't supposed to be moving towards. Um, and if could you go back to the um, the this you had a census map up there as well. You know you 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 have a level of separation of of the neighborhood. So I think that's that's important to understand as well as looking at the the voter turnout numbers that you've reduced significantly. 
I think we wanted to keep neighborhoods together. Is that it? Okay. Councilmember Vega. Yeah, could, could we go through, we just went through uh, map number one, and could we do the comparables on map number one and five, if, we would, if you wouldn't mind? Sure. So the, um, the, the comparison, if we just look at the summary statistics to start out with, um, 101 has a maximum Latino district um, by citizen voting age population of 51%. 105 has 52%. The next highest is 47% in 101 and 39% in 105. Um, if we look at the boundaries, um, 105 is much more compact, particularly in keeping that central area together um, in, area, in area two in this map. But it would, it would work with the criteria that we're under, correct? Because we did not exclude map five, so one and five seem to be. I think I think there's a there's there's, there's different standards. You know, do they both meet the basic legal requirements? Yes. We believe that they're both legally defensible. However, what we're getting at is precisely an important trade-off to discuss tonight, which is that 105 keeps the Latino community together. It has a high, you know, it has one district at 52 percent, but that fall off to the next highest Latino district is down to 39%. 101 does not keep that neighborhood together completely, but when we go from the first highest Latino seat to the second, it's a fall off from 51% to 47%. Um, now, either of them, we believe, are legally defensible choices, and they represent a trade-off between keeping that neighborhood together and how Latino is that second highest Latino seat. Um, you know, and that's a decision that council can decide which one is which one is your pleasure. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Um, we'll open this up for public comment. Dave Andrews, Mission Hills. Initially, we see on the screen no racial ger gerrymandering. Then we see a chart that has Latinos at the top, and we talk about where they live and their district. I'm 66 years old. This sounds very much like the old redlining of the old days. And where are the black people supposed to live in Lompoc? And where are the Asian people supposed to live in Lompoc? Are the Latinos required to stay in that specific neighborhood? Of course, all aligned with voting. This sounds very old fashioned and very segregationist to me. They should live throughout Lompoc and we shouldn't divide Lompoc according to race or voting districts according to race. They should be throughout our community. Everyone should. Thank you. Anyone else? Mayor Lingle, members of the council, thank you for your service to the community. My name is Lanny Ebenstein, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Santa Barbara County District Elections Committee. You've received a number of letters from members both of the Lompoc District Elections Committee and the Santa Barbara County District Elections Committee in favor of Map 101. And I think that the discussion was well framed uh, by, uh, the, uh, by, the, by the presenter with respect to, uh, with Map 105, you have one district at 52% Hispanic and another, the second at 39%, Whereas in District 101, you'd have 51% and 47%. So there really is only a one percentage point difference on that first district, but there's an eight percentage point difference on the second district. And I believe that's the reason why members of the committee feel that uh, map 101 would be, the best, uh, would be the best map. We think that it has the most natural boundaries it uh, divides Lompoc from north to south for all districts and then from east to west for districts two and three. We think those are good boundaries and, and, and flow with the community. Um, and it should be noted too that while the citizen voting age population would not be over 
50% in the uh, District 3. Um, it is the case that with respect to the total populations, um, they would be 65% uh, and 62% respectively in Districts 2 and 3 uh, would be Hispanic. Uh, and with Hispanic voting age population as opposed to citizen voting age population would be 58% and 56% uh, respectively, so that looking toward the future, uh, and particularly uh, after the 2020 census, I think that, that both districts at that point in time would then be more than 50% uh, Hispanic voting age populations. Um, we're uh, also of the view that uh, there's a slightly larger variance in uh, MAP 101 than in others, but this is legal. And uh, it's only about 350 individuals that could be moved. Uh, it's actually districts two and three that have each about 350 residents more than districts one and four. So perhaps those boundaries could be tweaked ever so slightly to bring that variation down, or it could just be leaving it the way that it is. Um, we're also of the view that uh, the uh, boundaries that should be chosen should be those that create what the council believes is the best districts for the long term, uh, irrespective of uh, council member terms. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Good evening, council members. John Lynn. You know, the problem with this is we're not a segregated town. Um, Hispanic people, white people, black people, Asian people live everywhere in Lompoc. So when you try to create these districts, it becomes very difficult. I spent uh, quite a number of hours the other day analyzing all the districts here and then playing on the computer trying to get a better understanding of, of what it would take to reach all of the good objectives. You know, our goal here first is to create a Latino district and that's not that hard to do. There's a central district, and the point is well made that it should be one district to support all of those people. In 20 years, probably none of this conversation will matter anyway because there's population trends in California and in Lompoc that will change everything that we do here tonight. Um, I'm concerned about maps 101 through 104, which create districts in which two council members reside. Now, I, I know that that's not our primary concern, but, you know, gerrymandering has been a, um, a practice for political gain that's long and black in our history. And frankly, these maps, in my opinion, do exactly that. And I think this is particularly heinous because our stated goal is fair representation, and yet we're moving things around to be unfair. Every member of this council was elected by the residents of Lompoc in a citywide election, which is gonna be much tougher to win than a district election, I think we will all agree. Two council members were, appear to have been targeted in maps one through four to be, have been put in the same district. One of them is the highest vote getter in every election that person has been in and the other one has been one of the highest Hispanic vote getters in elections that that person has been in. So it's disappointing that those maps have come out that way. And I think we can do a better job. I think the proponents of this can take 102, which does not divide their central district, and work to resolve the issue. I think the mayor's friends that did 103 and 104 can do the same thing. And I think 105, 8, and 9 can work on the criteria of improving the number of Hispanic voters in a second district. Personally, I want to add one other thing to it, and that's gerrymandering. Clearly, number 11 is the king of that. But if you uh, take a ruler in a couple minutes and you measure the boundaries on each map, that should be a guide to you. In fact, a compact district is easier for you to represent and easier for the residents to be part of. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm just, I have no idea what was meant by the one comment 
Mayor's friends making maps three and four because I have no idea where that came from, but that's okay. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment, bring it back to the council. Councilmember Mosby. In comparing 101 and 105, this kind of seems some of the, the favorites. Um, so, and I, I'm in a, the, the consultant keyed on it when he said looking for the future. And when you look toward the future and you look at total population uh, numbers, you have a 35%, 65, 62, 38. And one item that's unique in map number five is you already have three of the districts by total population. Um, well, the first one is 35, then you go 64, 53, 50. So you have three of the districts already by total population that have um, e either neutral or right at a majority, which is unique in that map. And if you're, if you're looking for trends for the future, um, that definitely 105 makes it an answer. And in my discussions with a lot of my Latino friends, um, which I'm not sure we, ha we had some of the, the public who didn't make it here tonight, but um, I don't think they realize really what's going on in Lompoc and where people have been, but at least for the last five years, um, closer to 10 years, I had about a thousand of my Latino friends come to my property weekly. Um, and when I asked them what they thought, they wanted to know why they wouldn't be able to vote for me anymore and why they couldn't represent that, that way. I told them you know, I'd still be able, if I was still on, to do that, but even though they couldn't vote for me anymore. So they were, they were very offended by the fact that it was being drawn up and they wouldn't be allowed to have that opportunity uh, when you look at some of the areas that where my signs went up, but signs that had never been up with a, somebody running for a council having their signs posted. Um, I explained to them it was something that was kind of a mandate because of the, the threat of litigation that we were moving forward with and it was designed as the will of the people. But they did tell me and stress to me that, that their voice had been put out there and they felt that um, if we did something that was such that their will wasn't looked at, meaning if we lined up district and we district one of us out, which was elected at, at large, they felt that that was something that they weren't um, in favor of. So they felt that, that it was an opportunity to stay and, and be able to divide up, which, which I think was maps like five through 11 didn't district a council person out. And that was one of the, the statements that you said there, you know, respect for voters' wishes and continuity of office. And I think we're able to come up um, with several maps that meet that. And I really, as I look towards the, the, the future, um, you know, three has a closer opportunity that three of the districts shortly would be um, a, a majority Latino, relatively easy, where map number 101, um, you're looking at, again, 35, 65, 62, and 38. So those are further off from the future towards looking towards the representation of the so-called minority majority. Anyone else? Okay, so one of the things that they'd like us to do is any maps that we'd like to eliminate tonight. Obviously, map number 10 is one I think we can all agree to eliminate since it doesn't fit the criteria. So, um, does anyone object to eliminating number 10? Councilmember Mosby. No, I, I agree with you on number 10. Okay. Um, Councilmember Osborne. Based on recommendation for our consultants, it seems 106, 107, and 111 don't meet the minimum requirements for the two majority districts. So eliminating those makes sense. Okay, uh, Councilmember Vega. And I agree with that. Councilmember uh, Mosby still has your light on? Yeah, I agree with that as well. Okay, you wanna leave your light on? Yeah, I just okay. wanted to make a comment that I think that the, the maps that don't respect the voters' wishes and the con continuity of office, I think those maps should be um, eliminated. Um, which maps are those? And if the consultant could help me out with that. So the maps that contain council members that are paired are 101, 102, 103, 104, and 110, which is already on the list. So which maps does that leave so us 101, with? So that would leave us with 105, 
108 and 109. Given the response by supporters of 101, I think it unfair to eliminate 101 this round because of the number of individuals that have shown up and supported that. Eliminating it at this round is unfair to those that have voiced support. We're still in discussion, still up for public discussion, so um, I could not support removing 101 given the public support that I've heard on that one. The others where it results in competition against sitting council members, I really need to hear from the public because I fear gerrymandering to protect our seats. I realize that is not what the gerrymandering definition at the federal level is, and I realize that we aren't trying to protect our seats, but eliminating every map that only allows for each of our seats to be protected feels a bit like localized gerrymandering and protecting our seats. And that's not what I'm here for. So I, I want to make sure, especially with 101 being supported by so many individuals, that we don't eliminate something that is supported. And I think we should at least leave a map in that discusses the four open seats running into competing with each other as a potential. It's, it's part of a discussion that has been brought up. It's been represented several times. They just aren't here tonight. Okay, can I get the council to agree on something? Have, do we all agree that 6, 7, 11, and 10 can be eliminated? Councilmember Vega? Yes. Councilmember Mosby? And yes. Okay, so 6, 7, 10, and 11 we're going to eliminate. Okay, now, um, Councilmember, and if it's okay with the council, at this round, I'd like to make the elimination unanimous. Um, is that okay with for this round for the rest of the council? Or should we just make it a majority? Councilmember Vega, what do you want it to be? I prefer it to be the majority. Councilmember Mosby. I think majority is fine. Councilmember Starbuck. What did you just ask us again? Okay, so 6, 7, 10, and 11, the entire council decided to eliminate those. Right. Now let's, for example, uh, map number 101. Council member Osborne would not like to eliminate that map at this time. Her reasoning is we have heard from the public to, they prefer there's several members of the public, not the public, but several members of the public. We've all received the emails from these individuals saying they'd like to keep it. So my question is, for this round tonight, does it have to be unanimous to eliminate a map? Do we all have to agree to eliminate 101, or can one of us stop it? Do we all have to agree to eliminate 3, 4, and 5, or can one of us stop it? Or can three of us stop it? So my question is, the majority of the council, three members, can eliminate a map, or five members tonight? Three, a simple majority. Okay, so okay, so if any map can be eliminated with three members of the council. Okay, so right now it's six, seven, 10, and 11. Are there any other, any other maps that the majority of the council wishes to eliminate? Councilmember Vega. I think we should go ahead and eliminate 101. Also with that. Okay. I think we're here to delete maps. And I think we've already, that's what we're here for public comment. That's why we have public comment. So I think we're here to, to make something happen. Okay, do I have a second on eliminating number? Well, as a Caucasian minority, I'll agree. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to eliminate 101, any discussion? Let's forward. That passes 3-2. Okay. Any other map that someone would like to eliminate? Okay, so the remainder of the maps will go on for further discussion. We, we heard something earlier about 2, 3, and 4, but I'm going back on that. I had mentioned 2, 3, and 4 because of the the respect to the voters' wishes and the continuity of office, 
as diagrammed over there, so I'd make a motion to get rid of the, the two, three, and four. Okay, I'll second. I'll give you a third on that one also, just for the sake of the districting on it. Okay, so well, now we are voting on eliminating two, three, and four. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Let's vote on that. That goes three, two. Okay, so two, three, and four. So that leaves us with um, five, eight, nine. Five, eight, and nine, is that correct? Okay, so five, eight, and nine will come back to us at the next meeting. And uh, now the public still has an opportunity to comment on any of those three. That's right, and, and the public can certainly comment on whatever they wish to comment about. Even on the ones that we've eliminated for the discussion. They, they can certainly, that's their part of the public hearing. They sure, can okay, okay. On any map. And I do recall that you actually said they still have time to submit another map if interested as long as it's submitted in time. That's right, we will need public. to have that by the end of November. We actually need it before the end of November because we have a seven day seven period that we have to have a pub, so it'd have to be maybe the last Monday of November. Okay. Okay. Councilor Starbuck. It, if there was to be some adjustments on one of these three maps, if we wanted to balance some of these districts a little better, how as a council member are we gonna proceed to do that? Are we gonna do that through the city attorney or what is our process here if we want to try and align these so that they're a little bit more uniform? It would be to have a discussion about what you'd like that realignment to be, and then the consultant could go back and realign it and bring it back at the next meeting. So we have to call the consultant? I would suggest you have the discussion now. Well, I'm not real sure what I want to do if I want to do anything yet. Okay, would that come back as another map? Or as it would come back as another map? That's right. The original versions of, for example, let's say it was to 109. Then, you know, the original version of 109 always stays as 109. There would be another map, probably would call it 112, following this pattern that made that revision. Um, of course, you know, any member of the public can use any of these three maps or any of the maps here tonight as a template for their own, to, to start their own drawing as well. So if they want to start with 105 and play around with some of the edges, um, they can do that um, on the Draw Lompoc website as well. Councilmember Vega. Well, I'm sorry, you know, the, we have three maps left. Um, so at our December 5th meeting, um, how is that going to work here? Okay, we're going to eliminate the other two and end up with one, regardless of the modifications or the submittal of an additional map? or adopt one of the new maps that's presented at the December 5th meeting. Okay, so it's all gonna happen just, on December just, just 5th. To be, just for the record to be clear, if we come back on the 5th and you make some revision that night, we won't be able to right. introduce the ordinance. We'll have to have another public hearing because we have to publish that map. If we publish, if, if the addition to the 105, 109, and 108 is published on, uh, seven days before the 5th, then you could adopt that map as well. So the idea is okay. on the fifth to introduce the ordinance with one map being adopted. Okay, so th these three maps are in. If anybody else submits a map, it has to be seven days before our next meeting. Is that correct? Correct. correct. For it to be considered. Otherwise, it delays our time frame one a little bit more. Correct. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you. I think. We're done with item number seven now. Okay, we'll move on to item number eight. Uh, okay, this is a direction regarding Lompoc Cemetery District, request for intergovernment agreement. This is uh, Melinda Wall, or? Yes? Okay, we're, I guess we're looking Let's take a five minute break. And just for the record, Council, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I've got to recuse myself because I own property within 500 foot.
turn to the dais. Okay, we're moving on to item number eight, which is uh, direction regarding Lompoc Cemetery District request for intergovernment agreement. And just for the record, uh, Councilmember Mosby has stepped out of the room. He has to recuse himself because he has property within 500 feet. Don't look like Melinda, but go ahead. Uh, good evening. This is Brad Wilkie, Management Services Director. Um, Melinda. Um, is not here tonight, so I'm filling in for her. Um, we received, the city received a request back in March of 2017 uh, asking us to consider entering into a negotiation to have an agreement to provide water um, as well as some other planning issues. This is only related to the water qu question that was brought up in that letter. The, the district, as you know, uh, has a cemetery facility that's adjacent to but outside the city limits. And with the um, review of all the city accounts in the last couple of years after we did our rate review in 2013, uh, we found that we were not billing them correctly on the water rate. So when that was changed, um, at the same time we were reviewing all accounts that might be at or near the city boundaries. So. With that, they began paying and received the bills for the, that for water at one and a half times the rate for city residential city rates, and they asked if there could be some accommodation. The fact that they're a governmental entity allows us to enter an agreement with them if um, if desirable, similar to the arrangement that we have with Annenberg Village for um, receiving their sewage for processing at, at the regional plant. Um, so on July 18th, we brought a agenda item to council that was subsequently pulled before, the, before it was heard because we wanted to get clarification on um, whether we could enter in, into this arrangement with that entity because of um, outstanding commitments of the um, cemetery with members of the council. So. Uh, the attorney's office sent a letter to FPPC requesting clarification of whether we could enter into a contract with the cemetery district with those um, potential um, conflicts. Uh, they took quite a while to mull it over and determine what the course of action was, but they finally got back to us um, late October and said there are no conflicts. There, it is something that we could do without jeopardizing any um, governing board members um, status. So at this point in time, the request is to obtain um, direction from the city council of whether they would like us to um, consider that type of a, a, a arrangement with the uh, cemetery district. We've not communicated with them. We've not created any kind of terms or conditions. Uh, we haven't generated any kind of agreement yet. We wanted to get some direction first from the council to determine our next steps. And so that's really in a nutshell what the, the action item is tonight is whether or not the council wants to consider the request from the cemetery district to um, go through the process of a, an agreement for water and utility services. Any questions for Mr. Wilkie? Councilman Starbuck. Um, I don't have a question for you, Mr. Wilkie, but I, I just wanted to make a couple of statements here. The, the conflict was based upon my purchase of a right of burial plots up there. Uh, the FPPC did say there is no conflict because I have purchased a place to be buried, two of them. Um, the other perception comment that might be out there is the fact that I wanted to let out that my, my dad sits on the cemetery board. There is no conflict with this either. So just to put it out in the open, 
This is one of the requests I brought up talking, obviously, with my dad and some other members of the board when we did the one and a half time increase. I, I will kind of just mention here that, like you say, it's an intergovernmental agency that we would be dealing with here. Part of the intent is, is the cemetery would spend the same amount of money that they currently do, they would just buy more water with the extra funds. So instead of it being semi-evergreen cemetery, it would be evergreen cemetery. It, it's, what would happen is if they were to make semi-evergreen evergreen at the current rate, all of us, the future customers, which it's pretty inevitable some of us are gonna wind up there, would have to pay more for their forever home. So the intent of bringing this up is, is to go ahead and allow the cemetery, which is across the street from the city limits, with city meter that they're paying $346.37 a month, buy water at the flat rate, they will buy more water, they will green the cemetery, and it's pretty much a win for the citizens, the cemetery board, and even the city, we don't lose. So these guys are functioning on just a small sliver of property tax or an endowment facility. I, I think that anything we can do to help them will eventually help all the citizens in Lompoc. Anyone else? Okay, we'll open this up. To, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I'd just like to clarify what um, Councilmember Starpark was saying. The reason why we thought it was important to clarify that with FPPC of whether there was a conflict or not is if they made the decision that yes, there was a conflict, it doesn't just create some sort of penalty or anything. It is a transaction that would have been prohibited by the city to do. The city just would not have been able to enter into a contract at all. So we wanted to, for um, safety sakes and for um, to be very conservative, we want to make sure we weren't doing something that would later become a problem for the city, uh, and that was determined not to be the case, so we can move forward. And I think we all thank you and the city attorney for getting that clarif clarified for us. So, okay. We'll open this up to the public. And from the public that wishes to comment on this item. No? Oh. Okay, seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment, bring it back to the council. So I just have two quick questions, um, and I believe I know the answers to them. Um, the other one, or the first question is, I believe, I believe the answer is no. Could this be considered a gift of government funds? This is for Mr. Pannoni. No. Okay, I, that's what I didn't think. Um, and the other, item I have is, and I believe the answer is, it doesn't matter because it's an intergovernment uh, agreement. Others outside the city that are currently paying one and a half times, how does this affect them, the residents that are outside the city paying Well, it does, affect, it does matter that it's a governmental agency because we're able to do this because it is a governmental agency, just like we are doing with Vandenberg Village and Vandenberg Air Force Base on this sewer uh, treatment plant. So. Okay, thank you. But that does, so this agreement would not automatically allow for other individuals outside the city limits to now qualify for flat rates? Or for this. Nobody but another governmental entity. Okay, good. Yeah. Put another way, this does not create a precedent that forces you to have to enter into contracts with others. Okay. Good. Uh, Councilmember Starbuck, you had a question. I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we move forward with the intergovernmental agreement to sell the cemetery district water at a flat rate cost. I'll second. Okay, motion and second. Any discussion? I'm, we're going to say see Evergreen Cemetery real soon, right? Okay, thank you. And that passes four zero with one abstention. Okay, um, we'll call Councilmember Mosby back in. <laughs> 
Okay, this is item number nine. It's uh, general plan amendment discussion and direction as deemed appropriate. Uh, Councilmember Vega, this was at your request. Do you have any opening comments on this? No, I, I'd like to thank Brian for bringing his material and information. I've had a conversation with him and I think he knows uh, that we're here to provide information and a little direction here so that we can improve anything that could be uh, improved upon in the, in the 2030 general plan. Thank you, Council Member Vega. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, <clears throat> as requested uh, last month, uh, I want to give a short presentation on the general plan in Lompoc. Uh, as you know, on October 3rd, um, our city, our planning manager, Lucille, gave a presentation, and at that meeting, there was a request to bring back a, a discussion about the general plan. Uh, specifically, just for this meeting tonight, we're going to focus on the land use, conservation, open space, and the economic development element. What I did is just as a starting point is attach the goals, the policies, and the implementation measures. <clears throat> Obviously, it's a very large document, and so I thought that would be a good starting point uh, to get input on those, those items. Uh, real quickly, and some of these, I apologize, but some of these slides, because I thought they were good, um, are from, uh, they've been modified, some of them from the meeting back on October 3rd. Uh, the general plan is a long-range planning document for the community and is actually a visioning document that's supposed to represent the community as well. All elements of the general plan have equal legal status and must be internally consistent. What that means essentially is that the elements inside the general plan should not conflict with one another. Uh, there's minimum statutory requirements. Um, for example, the elements that are in the general plan, there's required elements, and even the content um, is, is regulated as well. Parts of the general plan, and I have a feeling that's going to be kind of the focus tonight, are the goals, the policies, and implementation measures. Implementation measures are also can be called objectives. Uh, a goal, um, just to reiterate, is, a, is the general direction statement, kind of where the city wants to go. And then a policy is supposed to be a commitment to that course of action. And then how do you implement? Everybody wants to implement an action, and so implementation measures or objectives are, are what carry out the policy. <clears throat> now tonight we're gonna talk about the three elements. The land use element identifies the proposed general distribution intensity of uses of the land for housing, business, industry, open space, natural resources, public facilities, water, or waste disposal sites, and other categories for public and private uses. One of the key components is also the land use map, and that's a, uh, a map that will display all the different land uses that are allowed in town, and then, of course, uh, what is allowed and, and the density requirements as well. Conservation open space, another required element, provides direction regarding the conservation, development, and utilization of natural resources. And the adoption of these elements are shown at the bottom. Lastly, the economic development element, not every city has one. It is optional, it's not required, um, but the city of Lompoc does have one, which is a good thing. Um, and it addresses the economic health of the city and establishes goals and policies that encourage economic growth while also maintaining and improving the quality of life in the community. The city included this element for the first time in the general plan. Just a couple kind of points about uh, amendments since the discussion was kind of triggered because uh, amendments may be a request. Um, as a general law city, we are restricted for four times. Um, and as a reminder, uh, we all know that we're reviewing a zoning ordinance update right now. That will come to you next year, as well as um, I'm personally working on a community health center project that will require a general plan amendment and zone change. So that's two, two of the four that are already kind of in the, the docket, so to speak, for next year. Um, all amendments need secret review. Um, I re very rarely see an exemption to amend the general plan, and that can be kind of risky <coughs> from a lawsuit, lawsuit standpoint. Public participation is a, is a key component. Um, during that time, the public gets to weigh in on you know, various uh, aspects of the city, where they think the city's going, their goals, their vision uh, for the area that they live. Now, something that I apologize wasn't mentioned in the council report, but it's something that I wanted to bring up is a new requirement for an environmental justice. Um, we weren't required when we did our 2030 general plan to have an environmental justice element, but in 2018, new state law requirements uh, required to have a separate element addressing um, environmental justice 
or have uh, policies that address it if you amend two or more elements. I've looked through our general plan and I believe that we do have policies and goals and things like that that address environmental justice, but there are, I think there are some gaps. And so that would be something we would need to address uh, those gaps. Um, in a nutshell, without kind of going into it too much, essentially it, it addressed disadvantaged communities in, in the city. Uh, for example, just one, ex one example, but there are others, is identifying areas that are low income in the city and not uh, exposing those areas to maybe uh, undue pollution, noise, et cetera. Uh, fiscal considerations, um, going into this discussion, I uh, worked with Brad and wanted to kind of look at, you know, what we have in our budget as far as availability of funds. Right now, if we were to do a city-initiated <coughs> amendment, we do not have funds that have been earmarked or specifically for those amendments. Um, normally the, the amendments would come out of the general plan maintenance fund, but unfortunately that fund is, is already allocated to the, the update of the general plan or the zoning ordinance, and it's not sufficient right at the moment to cover a city initiated amendment. And also going back <clears throat> to the slide, we also use some of that money uh, to make amendments to the housing element. I think that was 2015. Lastly, uh, kind of the purpose here is to give directions to staff regarding those three elements that I spoke about, uh, anything that we'd like to, to talk about and where um, you're thinking amendments might be required. Also just, you know, continue to remind you that environmental review is required, um, you know, reaching out to the public, engaging the, the city members, the residents in Lompoc regarding you know, what potential amendments would occur. And then that turns into you know, a proposed amendment and a recommendation that's made by the Planning Commission to the City Council. And then the Council would uh, consider that and, and take action on that proposed amendment. That does conclude the City uh, staff presentation. We're available to ans answer any questions at this time. I'm available. And so I'd like to just close it in that. Councilman Vega. Brian, uh, it looks like we need to go toward the direction of a, of a workshop to do any additional amendments or improvements to this document. Um, not sure exactly how we would go about that here right now, but uh, for now, I think that's, that's where we're going, correct? I mean, that's what, yeah, we need, that's, what needs to happen. Yes, Council Member Vega, that's usually what it turns into is, you know, uh, advertising it, you know, letting the community know, inviting them to say a setting like this, um, and then reach out to the public. If there's specific topic areas that we want to bring up, <clears throat> we would bring it up at that, that time and then see where that would go. Okay, thank you. Councilman Mosby. Question, do you have some side idea <clears throat> what it would cost to change a couple shells to shoulds <laughs> through the document? That's a good question. No, not offhand. I do not know the I mean, cost. Are you talking tens or hundreds of thousands or what is it? Uh, yeah, looking at the general plan. Maybe there you can get back to us with that or something like that. I yeah. don't, I just, that's, um, and, and I agree, you know, workshopping, it's important, you know, even if we had a workshop and we didn't do any changes, important to have the workshop so it's a document. I mean, it is kind of a guiding book of the city, so I think it would be important for us to kick the dust off it. I think the, it, it been cut kind of dusty for a while there, maybe what, 17 years, I think, in between major changes. Yeah. So I think it'd be good to kick this out and, and, and you know, expose it to sunlight and let the public see a little bit of it. And <laughs> so I, I would go along with that as a, as a workshop on, a, on an off day. I think following, just getting, getting back to your question on the cost, Councilman Mosby, I think following the input from the community and seeing what type of movements, I know you said the, the shalls, the shoulds, and sometimes I notice there's even statements that say, shall encourage. That's not extremely common in my experience. It's usually should or shall. So, um, you know, we would work with an environmental consultant um, and look at, you know, after the public workshop of where we're going, getting, you know, an estimate of the cost and then go from there. I, I definitely wouldn't want to assume the cost at this moment. Councilman Starbuck. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, the cost is always going to be a consideration, but this document becomes priceless. So no matter what, we're going to have to bear the cost at some point on it. I mean, it is our guiding document. 
I guess the question is here, if we were to update one element at a time, would we be able to phase in the environmental justice part that you were speaking of, or is that an element that we just, an optional element or mandatory element that we would just go ahead and, and do when we do do an amendment? Good question. Um, it, it specifically says the reading and research that I've done, it's two or more. So I would assume, although I would weigh in um, on that and do a little more research, that if you just did one element, that it wouldn't apply. Uh, it's two or more. Um, but at the same time, I think it's, it's good to see where the gaps are and see if we can address those and maybe in a low cost fashion. Um, and then I'm sorry, you had another question. No, that was kind of it. I just, I'm very confused with the environmental justice title and then what your description was. It's kind of- just, It is required um, and yeah. that's starting in 2018. This has been going on discussion since the 80s, uh, the 90s and you know, it's here to us now. Um, I don't think it would be difficult, but just it's an added thing that we would need to do. Like a new element could, could get costly, but you don't necessarily have to do a new element. You could have policies that address it. But right now, I think there are some gaps. Based on my research of the general plan, there are some gaps. So there is mitigation on this uh, environmental justice, so to speak. We, we would be able to add it into goals and practices and parts of the general plan. Yeah, without actually adding a new element. Yes, yeah. that's correct. I guess you know, I mean, I'm all for the workshop. I mean, this is something that needs to be re-looked at. We have not looked at our general plan, plan for several years. Um, but on the other hand, I don't want to have a conflict with our zoning ordinance. This is something that's pretty parallel in importance and is due to come out here very soon, you know, another few months. Is there anything that we can do parallel with that or are we better to finish zoning and then look at general plan or, or what would you recommend we do just so we don't step on ourselves with the zoning ordinance? Well, I would say the zoning ordinance is a huge um, priority for the city uh, because Believe it or not, the, the, plan, the general plan that we have right now is relatively new. It's not outdated, it's, it's not 20 years old or whatever. So I think the zoning ordinance should come first, but at the same time, what we could do concurrently is have the workshop and then see what comes up and what is kind of the, the direction where the community, the council, and the planning commission, and depending on you know, what those things are, it's a possibility it could be integrated. It's just hard to say right now because we're already kind of deep into the zoning ordinance. But I want to also caution you that just making a change, say in one element, could affect other elements. So that's really important. And, you know, some of these policies are not there uh, just for no reason. They're there because, uh, you know, they're representing other areas that are a concern in the city. And I'd like to just echo that because Council Member Starbuck, I'm glad you asked. When I first came here, there was, um, I remember people telling me about a lot of confusion caused by the general plan being updated in 1974 and the zoning ordinance not following very clearly. And that caused years of concern and misinformation about how people utilize their property. So the zoning ordinance update really is a, a, a huge priority for us to finish it. The general plan was adopted three years ago and two years ago we had some of the elements finally adopted. So, um, you know, it's, uh, the last one was 1974, that was a much older one. Um, this was a big undertaking and to finish it completely by getting the zoning ordinance done is very important. Councilman Mosby. Yeah, just a, a question of, you know, finishing up budget stuff, but in the budget one of the movements was to, to no longer fund um, the museum and then going through the, the, the documents and such we had here under the the cultural resource policy 2.4 it says the city shall continue to support the Lompoc Museum. If we had not continued to fund it, would we have gone through the process of not doing a CEQA notice and, and the whole everything um, to, to redo the general plan? Would, would that have triggered a full reevaluation of everything? That's a good question. I, I really don't know at the moment just because I, I wasn't here at the time, but I'd like to look into that a little bit more. Um, you, you did bring that up recently about the museum. And so, and now it looks like that, that property could potentially, you know, be on the market one day too. So um, I, I think we just need to talk about that a little bit more before I, before Mr. I Pannoni, were you going to weigh in on that? 
Excuse me? I, no, okay, you, you city attorney. I, I just use, listening to the terminology of the use, support, city support doesn't necessarily mean city financing. So support can take the whole sorts of uh, opportunities. Thank you. So that, again, understanding something like that, I mean, I, I look at maybe determine uh, the support differently. So uh, during our workshop, I think maybe we should get to understand that a little bit more. Maybe we want some areas we want a little bit more teeth in it. Maybe some areas we want a little bit wider. But yeah, I mean, I, I granted, shall continue to support might mean that we, we give them a dollar a year. So I mean, maybe there is some other uh, levels of qualifiers that could be put in here. Okay, public comment. Thank you, Brian. John Lane Lompo, President. I think most of you recall the difficulty that we went through when the general plan didn't get updated and in 1997, some of the things got updated but they never finished the job. And uh, the council struggled for six years to create this general plan. So I think it was pretty well thought out. I think the staff and the council did a good job but as they say, things change. And I don't think you're looking for a, a rewrite of the general plan as much as you are perhaps looking at things that were in there where the expectation was that when you said this, it meant that, but the reality is what it's been applied, it didn't exactly come out that way. So I think a workshop would be an outstanding way to look at that and address some of these issues. And then it would give Brian an idea what the cost and the, the process to go forward and make the corrections would be. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Good evening, uh, John Seidenberg, founder of Lompoc Valley Visionary Group. Um, Lompoc native, general contractor, and local sculptor. And in my sculpture, I see also sculpting the city. I think it. I think you guys are on the right track, especially Shao. You know, should a lot of things that need to be changed so the city can move forward. Um, and. I had some questions, I think they kind of got answered, but you know, why are we addressing only three elements? Now I can see there's a budget. Uh, three elements of the foundation, are they the foundation of the general plan? My feeling is that all the elements of the general plan should be acknowledged, presented, streamline the process. However, obviously there's a monetary uh, sticker on that. Um, considering that time is of the essence and our city, city should not just survive, but thrive. Um, a lot of other cities are having downfalls and shortcomings, and so we have to look to the future to see what we can do to make make this city be on the top, be a, be a leader in our, in our county. Um, I have a saying that goes, if you don't know what you want, then don't complain when you get what you receive. So the general plan is definitely the key to our future. So, you know, I have a future of seeing things here, have great quality of life, the vision of uh, an Ag Expo Center, rodeo grounds, things that would be good for the community, also jobs, um, a fair park, that would work into a fair park, you could have the flower festival at the same place, you could have live music venues, other ways to bring in um, prosperity to the community. Um, Open space, there op seems to be a lot of open space around town that could be utilized for an art and cultural center or other amenities that would benefit our city culturally and financially. Uh, we can study cities that are thriving right now. There are cities that are thriving. Let's look at those and see what they're doing to make that happen. Use elements of their success to amend our general plan and modify it for the future. The verbiage in our general plan must be, remove the word shall not. Um, reconsider buffer zones, make Lompoc more accessible. When I was a kid, the entire town, county, riverbed, everything, you could go anywhere, anytime, do whatever you want. It seems now it's, it's pretty much closed up and um, can't do much of, much of anything. So also see we need 
local good paying jobs. And that means a city college or university that focuses on higher education and fields of demand that provides higher incomes as we have a surplus of labor that commute. So I urge you to take a look into the future and imagine how incredible it will be. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment, bring it back to the council. Um, direction. So I've heard three of you requesting a um, workshop. Councilor Starbuck? Yeah, I was gonna make the suggestion here that um, I know that Mr. Halverson's pretty busy with several things right now, but if he would like to be able to set up at your convenience a time that we could do a public hearing and workshop for all of us on the general plan, uh, I would like to just leave it to his discretion to fit into his workload, so to speak. I can, sure, absolutely. I can agree with that, but we'd have to bring back several possible dates to make sure that we're all available for that, so. Yeah, I can certainly look into that. I, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I will look at the, the timing and the workload as far as the zoning ordinance and how that will come into play. Uh, we're having a meeting next month with a consultant to talk about uh, the staff comments on the zoning ordinance because we're getting closer to releasing a public draft. We're not quite there yet. Um, but yeah, we can certainly look at some potential dates you know, for, for a public workshop and see how we can make it so it's, it's not expensive. It could be something that hopefully is, um, you know, considering the budget. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you, anything else? Oh, Councilmember Osborne. I'd like to request that it potentially be a joint workshop with the Planning Commission, given they will be the authority that actually reviews and makes those changes to make the recommendation back to City Council. And I think the sooner they're participating with that process, the better. I can agree with that. Anyone else? Go ahead. Third degree? No, absolutely. Okay. Okay, just one other item. Um, looking at the, the calendar and, and things that have come up, I noticed that once a year um, they do a joint meeting, Council and Planning Commission. And so that might be something that we could look into. I want to say I saw the calendar around March or something like that. So that could be something we could look into, unless you're wanting something a little sooner than that. I believe that's a report out of the Planning Commission about their annual, biannual report back to us what's going on. So I don't believe it'd be the right time to okay. do the workshop. Okay, All right. Anything else? Okay, Councilman Mosby. Uh, Brian, Mr. Hamilton, what's the Planning Commission's workload been in the last couple of months? Are they being overwhelmed or are they? No been pretty light yeah it's been light so uh, we've canceled the last two meetings and there was other cancellations as well so um, we haven't been very busy as far as projects that would actually come up uh, we are having a December meeting so we're very excited about that <laughs> um, but yeah they, they have been asking how come we haven't had any meetings and there's just there's items that are in the hopper so to speak that just haven't come up so but it's looking promising. We have some things that are coming up, a mixed use project in the Lompoc Record Building. Uh, Moore Sabani is in the process of, um, he already submitted plans for a new industrial building off of Commerce Court. Um, so there's other things that are coming up soon. So we look forward to So they to might look projects. forward to a workshop as well though, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Okay, let's move on to item number 10. It's a city council request to review of the biannual budget. Let's see, this is uh, Ms. Doubles. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council members, and the uh, members of the audience. My name is Laura Doubles, and I am the Deputy City Manager for the city. I am returning tonight per council request to clarify a few of the council's directives from the adoption of the biennial budget for fiscal years 2017-19 that was done on September 5th, 2017. After sending out a memo to the council on October 16th, 2017 to summarize the council's directives for the final print, there was a discussion regarding the accuracy of a couple of items that were brought up in the meeting held on October 17th. 
Therefore, staff is returning tonight to clarify those directives by votes from the council on three items. The first item pertains to equity adjustments. The city manager's staff report list was included in the adoption on September 5th, 2017, only included removing general fund only equity adjustments. However, some members of the council have expressed their intention was for all equity adjustments to be removed, regardless of the funding source. The council will need to vote to verify this intent. The second item pertains to new positions that are being added in this budget cycle. The draft budget book contains five requested new positions, but this was modified to only four by staff handout to council on July 18th. This modified list was not specified to be included in the adoption on September 5th in place of the draft budget book list and therefore the five positions in the draft budget book are the positions that were approved. If council intended to adopt staff's recommended list instead of the draft budget book list, the council will need to vote to verify this intent as well. The third and final item is the return of the eight updated supplemental sheets that contain the capital outlays and improvements lists for this budget cycle. Council had directed staff upon the adoption on September 5th to return with the updated list which staff is now bringing forward tonight and the council will need to vote to affirm these pages are the intent of the council and will be included in the final adopted budget book. That it concludes my presentation and I am available for questions and I believe some of the staff is present to supply information on the new positions being requested as well. Questions for Ms. Doubles? Must have done a great job. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The members of the staff want to make comments now or just wait for questions? I guess you're going to wait. I think we're waiting for questions. Okay. Um, council, any questions or we go to public comment? Okay, let's go to public comment. John Lynn, city resident. Well, I was hoping there'd be some more people to talk about some issues, but let me take my shot at it. Um, you know, I gave you a document earlier discussing the current deficit situation within the city. And if I were sitting up there, I'd wanna know where we are today before I adopted a budget that might be a spending plan that was unsustainable. Second, at the utility commission meeting last Monday, it was announced that three vacant positions in the water plant would, be, would not be filled the maintenance supervisor and two positions in the meter shop because we have new meters all over town. And these late changes have not been incorporated into the budget document. I would hope you incorporate them this evening. On attachment two, both deletes and adds the utility conservation representative. It's kind of unclear what the end result is. I think that could be clarified. Additional discussion at the Utility Commission focused on the addition of a fleet maintenance technician to work on heavy equipment at the landfill. Both utility staff and the committee felt that using the current vendor who is trained by the manufacturer to work on our heavy equipment at the landfill was the best process. There's no PERS cost today for our vendor, nor would there be a PERS cost in the future, and as we all know, those costs can change rather dramatically. Um, contrary to prior testimony in the past, the process tonight you're being asked to approve a capital expenditure program before approving the capital improvement plan. Um, this is the proverbial cart before the horse. Now I've had that capital improvement plan sitting on my desk for about six months, but it hasn't made it back to council yet. And I would personally hope that you would not move forward with these until you review that capital improvement plan and vote on it. You'll recall the difficulty you had when you approved the full cost allocation plan and set a fee schedule without the ordinances to support it and the things that happened thereafter, the unintended consequences. If you do choose to approve it tonight, I would hope you would take care of three things that are glaringly wrong. 
Number one, both the Water Department and the Utility Commission agreed that well number 11 was not needed at the price of about a million five. Number two, the $2,120,000 for the landfill stormwater improvement should not be approved until a plan is brought, typically an engineer's estimate. It would be more typical to approve money to, for the study. And finally, on page 197, the $16 million fire station, which this council canceled, will have to be removed again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Seeing no one rise, we're going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. I'd like to, Councilman Mosby. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, with the first item, the equity uh, positions, the, the movement that back in August 22nd, I believe it was, in going forward was to um, not to throw out the equity adjustments, but to suspend them. And as we saw revenues potentially coming through, they could be um, repositioned, so to say, or, or pay, paid for. And maybe our, our mid-budget movement, when we see the numbers coming through, you know, you, they can line up and, and do it. But I, my discussion and thought process was to suspend not only the general fund, but all of them that were on the sheets being equitable in the equity adjustments and to suspend all of these as we progress through. Um, and, and then they come back as we see through, uh, again, mid-budget showings. We have revenues, that we have some really good numbers coming in on sales tax revenues, so it looks like we're gonna be bringing in more than we have, but we can see where we are maybe another, another few months and we can reassess at that time and maybe those equity adjustments could come through at that time. City Manager, if you could comment, I recall us discussing that, and I thought you asked us to clarify that point, and I believe the clarification was that it was just general fund positions that we were voting on. Is, am I rem remembering that correctly? The, the, to reach the particular number that was going to balance the budget, we had, um, we, we had included only those that were general fund related in what what we remove from the list. But as I said, I've had the conversation with Mr. Mosby and he, his intent, because originally we listed it all and then he made a, he, he brought to my attention that, oh, we're, we're over calculating the reduction we're doing in the general fund because we're counting them all and it's not just the, the general fund positions. So at that point, I just listed the general fund positions and uh, amongst the cuts and left the, the other non-general fund positions within the budget. So that's where the, the path sort of separated and so all we're asking is for clarification on, on council's intent. Okay, so if I, you know, uh, Councilman Mosby made his point clear. If we, if we can get two other people to agree that that was their understanding. Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, I, I thought along with Councilmember Mosby that the intent was that it was going to be across the board on the equity adjustments in the enterprises and general fund. I just had made that assumption at that meeting that that's what we were doing. That, that was also my understanding also that it was going to be across the board until we reached a little bit better fiscal time. Okay. Is that clear at this point now? Sure, I, and so we hear three, so we've got a majority, and, and I was just gonna ask that if we could ha handle each of these three issues that Ms. Doubles brought forward one at a time in case there were, the individual directions were different. So for, for number one, I think I'm hearing from majority that we are going to include in what's been removed from the current budget all the equity adjustments. That's what you're hearing, yes. Okay. Okay, and then the second point, Councilmember Vec, our Mosby. And in the second item was, you know, there were five positions presented to us, and then we had some of the positions weren't necessarily, um, they, were, they were changed to different, and we come back with four positions, but I think we never totally finalized, um, you know, what they were and, and 
went through with a motion to make sure that these positions were the positions that we're going forward with because they're not the same that was in the budget book. And just for the sake of clarification, I felt it'd be important as well that we did discuss these and, and make sure that these were positions that we um, most definitely needed. Um, so maybe somebody could give us a, an explanation of, of what they are. Great, so again, maybe if we take them just one at a time and uh, I don't know, do you wanna start with the fleet mechanic? Position. Thank you, Mr. Ishiwata. Appreciate it. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council, citizens. Uh, Dirk Ishiwata, Facilities Fleet Parks Manager. Ask away. The the Public Works Solid Waste. You're going to want to add a Fleet Maintenance Technician two. That is correct. Um, in my position as the fleet manager, I'm responsible to make sure and ensure that all our fleet is currently maintained and that I can use the best judgment possible to, to do cost savings. That said, currently at the landfill, uh, we are utilizing Quinn repairs for all our landfill equipment to be serviced. Um, in 2016, we spent about $82,492 in labor and about $43,000 in parts. Um, that is um, preventative maintenance numbers. Currently for 17, uh, we're into it about $67,134 for labor and $23,683.40 for parts. Um, in 2016, Quinn visited the landfill 45 times. Uh, currently in 17, they visited us 30 times. So if you try to break the numbers down, we're not getting our bang for our buck. We are actually paying them an exorbitant amount of money and we're not getting enough return on it. That's my professional opinion. Um, it's my job to increase reliability and serviceability. And that's not only at the landfill, but at the V Street Yard as well. And, and if I could add, just to clarify something, because there was some suggestion that what our attempt, that at one point or another, perhaps we were attempting of removing um, the uh, the dealer or the contractor Quinn company in this case altogether, but that's not the case. So we're, what we're trying to do is to be um, surgical and selective about what work we do internally that we can do cheaper than they would provide. But the bigger overhaul and machining work and things that they're qualified to do and we aren't we would leave with them, is that correct? Uh, that's partially correct. I currently have one heavy mechanic, he's my lead, and he actually could do all the serviceability at the landfill currently right now. That's his skill set. Um, what I would like to do is I'd like to utilize the funds that we're already, we're already spending and we're going to spend, and as the equipment ages more and more and starts breaking down more, the costs are just gonna continuously raise. They're going up all the time. And again, what I said earlier is we're not getting enough bang for our buck. We're losing money and we're not getting enough um, hours of serviceability. So for example, uh, so far uh, this year, again, as I said, 30 times they've been here. Um, if we had a full-time person, we would basically get 229 days out of the year. So do the math. So that in itself, we can have the person go up to the landfill, do all the services, all the preventative maintenance. and. You have to understand that preventative maintenance is such a key factor for fleet to run successfully. And since we have a dilapidated fleet as a whole, preventative maintenance needs to be the, the number one cause for us to, to make sure that we keep our equipment up and running to the best of our abilities. And if we're spending that much money, if we had a full-time person in-house, we could have them go to the landfill, they could go to V Street Yard, they could do all the maintenance, and they're on site eight hours a day. Um, you want to play it in a different spin. Um, so far this year, we've only utilized them about 240 hours. If it was a full-time person, we would have 1,824 hours in a year. I mean, it's, it's really not hard to see. The math is the math. Um, you know, again, as I said, I have to make sure that I have the least amount of breakdowns, that I have the highest customer service and uh, service reliability for, for Larry and for the V Street Yard. Um, to me, it seems kind of a no-brainer that we're spending the money already and it's gonna increase 
next year and a year until we get brand new equipment. And as the current budget stands, that's not gonna happen probably for a while. So Mr. Mr. Ishiwata, this person would not be working just on landfill equipment. When their maintenance is done there, the prevent, preventive maintenance is done there, they'd be working, going back to the yard and working on something else? Correct. So, so and my plan Quinn it just goes, works on the equipment and goes home? Exactly. Okay. So we would, my plan would be to have them be utilized at the landfill first, because that equipment needs the most help right now. Then they would go to B Street Yard because of all our trash trucks and their age. Um, they would have to, you know, that person would go to the B Street Yard to fix all the equipment there and do all the PMs that we currently have employees doing. We have non-mechanics doing PM work. Not to say that they're doing a, a poor job, but we've spent so far $140,000 this year just on the B Street Yard for services. By having this person, we could save about $56,000 by doing the proper PMs that we need to do. Okay. And if you compile that all together with Quinn, again, it's, it, it's a win-win. It's a win-win for the city. It's a win for, for Larry and his departments. Councilman Starbuck. Yeah, I guess the hidden number is, okay, with the numbers that you're showing us, you're right. But what does the PERS pencil out at later? What are the benefit packages? What is the actual total cost for this fleet technician to 53 to 67,000? Okay, that's salary. That doesn't talk about the benefits and our PERS obligation down the road with this. So has that been computed into these figures? Uh, no, the figures that I actually gave you were was the cost from Quinn right now. I haven't had the opportunity yet to calculate everything through for the oh, full-time employee. Yeah, Sorry, go Brad's got the answer for our costs. I'll address the issue related to the long-term benefits. The PERS, the PERS unfunded liability, that's one thing that is high up in everybody's minds. That long-term disability, that long-term liability was incurred through several years of Tier 1 being elevated from 2.0 at 55 to, I think, to 2.7 at 55, which was a huge jump in 2004, and also the jump for, for safety to 3% at 50. That was eliminated for any new hires beginning in 2013, and even for new hires that are already in the plan, uh, they are, have a lower benefit scale of the 2% at 60. The, so the four, the, the four plans that we have that are for new hires going forward are all fully funded. Uh, they, two of them actually have a surplus right now because of the experience in those with going forward. The same increasing contributions for PERS that is occurring for tier one to get us to the point of having fully sustainable pensions applies to those other plans as well. So by being fully funded, they're not gonna have that baggage of the $68 million that's on tier one. For the other large long-term liability is um, post-retirement health benefits. Um, that requires somebody to be here for um, 25 years and they don't even qualify for it unless they've been here for more than 10 years. Um, we have, be, since 2009, um, implemented a um, 115 trust fund that is pre-funding our obligations. Uh, it's funded about 48% of our obligations. From the perspective of employees, we're funding that at a, about 9.9% of salary going forward, and that percentage, based on the actuarial valuations that have been done for us, will be flat for the next 10 years. So those amounts wouldn't be growing. Um, obviously, if um, we have sustain, sustained reductions in returns from PERS, at some point in time, those amounts would be, um, for pensions, would go up. But remember, the employee in PEPRA pays half the um, normal cost, as opposed to the members that are in Tier 1 or Tier 2, which pay less than that. So the sustainability of an employee newly hired 
is much greater than it is for somebody who was hired in, say, 1994 or two, 2000 or 2002. Mr. Wilkie, so that we can answer uh, council members Starbucks question very directly. The number being shown here right now on new annual salary range is just the salary range itself, correct? Yes. And what is, so there's a percentage that constitutes uh, the percentage of salary that, that pays for a new hire's benefits. And what is that, around 29% or? I believe it's probably in that neighborhood. It, it it'll depend on whether they're tier two or tier three. Right. So two. So it's a, a, assuming I think the likelihood is if we're hiring a new mechanic, it's going to be tier three. Let Let's round up and say thir it's thirty percent. So that you've got the comparison of apples to apples because you're looking and saying, okay, here we're reducing a set amount of costs from in this case Quinn for for X number of dollars then what you're comparing that against is the total cost is uh, looking at the, the, the range salary and adding roughly 30% to that to get the total cost of employment. And that, that's what gives you your apples to apples. Now, in this case, I believe we're also getting some additional services. So if we're gonna make it true apples to apples, we recognize, well, we're, we're limiting some services uh, and costs to Quinn we're adding on not just costs, but additional services beyond just replacing the services from Quinn. Yeah. But that okay. should give you the apples. Thank apples. you, now I'm clear. So when you're rounding it up, you'd use the number 120,000 to contract with Quinn. So this, if you were rounded up roughly 30%, it would be 90,000. Correct. And we're getting additional man hours with the guy, vice the contracting, so Correct. thank you. Councilman Beck, or Councilman Mosby. The new equipment that we're purchasing, which I think in the list you have a potentially a new D8 coming in and three more side dumps and two end dumps and you just got four side dumps, is that gonna reduce a lot of the workload for repairs um, at solid waste? It would reduce it to some degree, but as long as we still have some of the other pieces of equipment there, uh, that person will still have a lot of work to do. Okay, so you, you professional opinion you think is justified and we're gonna do best by going this direction? I wouldn't say anything else other than yes. Okay. And that's my professional opinion. Okay. Good, to answer my question. So, I need three people to agree to move forward with the position. Well, did you wanna finish the other two? No, we're gonna take one at a time. Yeah, I'd oh, appreciate one we take okay. one at a time. When we're all done, then we'll take a vote with what everybody's majority indication has been on all the items of it. Yeah, I'd like to handle these one at a time if I can. Each position one at a time? Yes. Yeah, because you may not have the same um, vote on all of them. I'd vote to move forward with this position. I'll second. support. Okay, we've got a second and a third. Okay, I quick have a question on unrelated. When do our new trash got, trucks get their wrap? Um, well, as you may know, we had some issues with the new trucks. And I didn't want to give a false impression to the citizens that you know artwork has been displayed and then they don't ever see the truck on the road. Okay. So now we're we're almost at that end. So I'm thinking that within the next month you'll start seeing the wraps. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, next position. Yeah. So maybe uh, Mr. Bean, we can talk about the uh, electric position. Yeah. Yes, Larry Bean, Utilities Director. Uh, electric is asked for a compliance manager. Every year, uh, the state legislature adds more and more and more rules and reporting and compliance for the electric utility. Uh, to keep up with this, we need a compliance manager that will free up the electric utility engineer to work on design work to keep our system running. Uh, the positions that were proposed in the utilities were a conservation representative, not the conservation uh, coordinator. 
Jennifer Main is in place for that job and has been for some time. If you recall back uh, a previous budget, we had two. We had a coordinator and a representative, and then that went away with the last budget, and we've been running with one. Uh, Jennifer had asked for more help, and that's why we submitted this request. But we've been sharing the workload in the Office of Conservation. Uh, we've gotten through the water conservation, and the citizens are doing a great job. We think we can continue with that with one person. That is why we've scratched that to help pay for the electric utility conservation manager. Uh, the other one becomes a little confusing when it was written here, remove the program specialist from water. In uh, this budget cycle, state law allowed stormwater to be paid for out of water funds. So this from the Planning and Development Division, they added, wanted a stormwater specialist to be added into the water budget. And uh, that's what's being crossed out. I, if you have a question on that, I really would appreciate a yes on the electric utility compliance manager. So, Thank you. So I have one quick question, and I, I apologize, I should know the answer to this. This compliance, electric utility compliance manager, is that something we could get done through NCPA? Uh, they have a manager up there who used to work for us that deals with compliance, Marty. Right, so is this something that we could have them take care of? No, we need to do it ourselves so that we know it's reported correctly. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Mosby. This is the same position that you did the change from the budget book when we talked a couple months back? Absolutely, okay. yes. Councilmember Starbuck. Mr. Bean, you sold me on this when you had the NCPA rep here and he was explaining all of it. So, I mean, to me, this is a no-brainer and it's a good compromise, thank you. Thank you. So that's one, do we have a two and a three? I give him another one. Wrong light. Third. Okay, sounds good. Next position. Mr. Quinlan, you'll talk about each of the solid waste positions. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Keith Quinlan, uh, Solid Waste Division. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members. Um, the first position is the uh, program analyst and uh, we're requesting a uh, program analyst to help with regulations uh, in compliance with uh, Cal Recycle and state regulations. Uh, we have a mandatory commercial recycling law and a mandatory commercial organics recycling law that we have to uh, put forth a good faith effort and uh, show to the state that we're um, trying to make strides to increase recycling. Uh, if, if not, there is a potential from the state to be fined $10,000 a day. And I'm willing to uh, take any questions you may have regarding that position. Councilman Starbuck. Are either one of these positions gonna have anything to do with the gas monitoring system up there? Yes, the heavy equipment operator two position uh, is at the landfill and that will be assisting us with the new landfill gas collection and control system in the flare. Uh, that includes the welding of the pipes, raising of the wells, uh, lateral movement of the pipes, testing of the wells, and uh, testing and oversight of the flare. Uh, in addition, when they're not working on that, they would be performing heavy equipment uh, operator duties at the landfill. So there's no way you could combine these two positions then, really? No. One guy throw a match and one guy drives a dozer then. <laughs> Councilman Mosby. These are both basically mandated through the state regulations and stuff, one through recycling and, and the other through gas collection? Uh, yes, uh, we have gas collection requirements uh, through uh, Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District and the uh, State uh, Air Resources Control Board. And then the uh, other um, regulations are through Cal Recycle um, at the state level. I can't tell them since you don't give us any funding, we can't put them in. Right. Just kidding. Right, thank you. Any questions on this? 
Okay, um, can we have uh, an agreement on this? Councillor Mosby? I know you wanted to take one at a time, but I... Well, I think we take these two together, yeah. Give you, go forward with both of them, understanding that it's not your wishes, but we're doing what they wish. Thank you. Second. I'll give it a yes. third. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And I think that's it for positions, yes? That's it for positions. So the remaining issue has to do with capital expenditures. And just a quick comment I wanted to make with all due respect to Mr. Lynn's comment, I just wanted to clarify a capital improvement project, a CIP, and a capital improvement budget are two different things. To say that one's a, a horse and one's a cart and we got the cart before the horse misrepresents the relationship between the two. Basically, you can have a CIP without having any budgetary. One, one's a planning document, one's a budgetary document. You can be conducting your planning and not be taking any budgetary action. You can be doing, taking budgetary action and not be taking any planning action. So just wanted to clarify, this isn't cart before the horse because that's not the relationship between the two things. And, and for, for our purposes here, we're concentrating on the budget, the budgetary document. Okay. Are you gonna present that, Ms. Doubles? That would be the last eight pages that was your attachment three. And just so you all are aware, the only ones that are being approved for those, the two year cycle that we're in is listed under the proposed column. Proposed 1719. And as you can see, most all of them are actually zeroed except for in the enterprise funds. Okay, Councilor Starbuck. Just a quick question on page 199. We're, are we pulling money out of the impact fees? Obviously, the AB 1600 listed three times, police equipment, community recreation, and park improvements. Are, are we allowed to use the impact fees for these uses here? I mean, they are very restricted. It seems like we're dipping into the piggy bank again here. This was something I put in to allow for expenses that are qualifying AB 1600 costs within park improvements within a recreation center improvements and the one for police equipment is actually a request from the police department to provide up upgrades to their dispatch facility. So the reason why there are odd dollar amounts for the park improvements and recreation centers is that's the remaining funds in those accounts that are not already encumbered for specific projects. So for instance, if the park improvement has funding for um, bathroom remodels. If that project goes over budget for some reason or um, has a really great RFP and we want to do another bathroom, this would allow us to do that. We, obviously, when we bring that to you for approval of that project, we would probably say, and it's such a great deal, we want to do a, a, an extra one and we can use these funds to do that. So. This is not any type of use for um, O&M. It's not for something that's not related to the aspects that are in park improvements or recreation. Uh, it's only for those things that qualify for capital improvements under those two programs. Yeah, because here on page 197, we'll go to police services, for instance, uh, radio console replacements, dispatch, equipment replacements, dispatch, uh, furniture replacements, dispatch. There's several projects listed here that were not approved, but communication software out of AB 1600. Um, so I'm just unclear as to how we're divvying up what we're doing there. So replacing furniture is an OM O and M really activity. Right. You can't use AB 1600 fees for just replacing the furniture. But we but can do software. 
The software is new, I believe. So it's adding to the capabilities of the dispatch. So it, it would qualify under the, the fees. So why wouldn't radio console and equipment replacements qualify? You just said the word replacement. Yes, we're replacing. Well, we're replacing software. We're upgrading. We're <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah, one's additional capacity, one replaces capacity. Yeah. Councilor Mosby. And you know, understanding that the list is you know fourteen point eight million dollars, so it's a it's a big list that's coming through. And that's the proposed for the uh, enterprise fund proposed improvements. Um, but some of the questions I had uh, were were answered earlier today, but I do have one about the mandated stormwater improvements at the landfill, the two point one million dollars. Um, is is that um, is there a study that's involved? Or is that the best? You know, I'm, I know it's it's hard to go, and we're going somewhere because we're not sure. And you know, we start digging, what are we going to uncover? So if you can help me out. I don't want to use inappropriate language, but that's a wag. I, I guess I call it a swag. 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 Okay. swag. Yeah. Okay. Scientific wild. <laughs> okay. okay. It's our best thought. We don't have a solution to make the stormwater coming off the landfill pass the required tests re that, and then limits that are mandated by the state. Soon, when the, the next set of tests, when it rains, fail, we're going to have to hire an engineering firm to come up with a solution to clean that water. I don't know what the solution is. It might be buying a large piece of property and just storing all the water until it infiltrates into the ground. It might be a complete stormwater system that uh, cuts off all the water flowing from the land that belongs to the county, in the county from the south. That water can go in the storm drain, it hasn't touched anything. Then we may have to even treat the small amount of water that comes off of the landfill. So there are th three possible solutions that we've discussed. We don't have a real number. This is a placeholder. We can't spend this money until you would approve a contract. So the first thing we'll do is we'll come back with a design firm and a contract for you to approve to come up with a solution. And then after the solution is made, we'll have an engineer's estimate and we'll be back asking for that to go out to bid. We want it here as a placeholder so that in case of a lawsuit or something, we can say we are working on it. So that's my spiel. Well, it's good that, that it's a qualifier to let us know that could be less, it could, could be. be more. It's just that's I've good to, to see that. I've yet to find many things come out less in it's important engineering it's, for our utilities. Right. So it's important to see so that we don't get, we get a surprise, you've qualified that we could get. But, some, but we have no better number than this at this okay. point. I, in, the other question I had along that was the, there's a $200,000 covered disposal area. Um, is that a, um, it's further, just two numbers down from that. Solid waste. Covered, covered, covered. Construct covered disposal okay. area. Again, that, that has to do with some of the uh, comments we've had when the inspectors come to inspect us for the stormwater, that there's areas of where if we can keep the stormwater from hitting it, it'll improve the testing of our discharge. But now we're going to have to put some percolation basins to collect the water off the roof of the... Yes, we could save that and drink it maybe. <laughs> okay. All right, and... Um... The last one I had was about the airport. Um, there's a new construct airport maintenance facility and there's two items under airport. One says it's FAA funded, but there's, um, it doesn't say what the funding mechanism for the new construct airport maintenance facility is that, um, and I believe in the capital improvement book it identifies the $228,000, but it says not funded by FAA. 
I didn't bring my book to show you. I don't know if somebody has that one. Kevin McCune, Public Works Director. Uh, I believe both of those came out of the, um, the airport master plan, so they would both qualify for FAA funding if funding became available. I believe it says it's not funded for FAA in the capital improvement book, the, the construct, new construct airport maintenance facility. Hmm. Well, I'll have to do some research and get back to you on that. I don't know the answer right now. I apologize for not. Yeah. Somebody's got a book. Um, what do we do? How do we prove something we don't have? I just don't know what the funding, if, if, it's, if it is not coming out of general fund, that's one of my concerns, is, is, it, is it funded? It could potentially be funded by general fund. And I just, my concern is, is that a general funded item? The answer to that is no. It's funded by airport generated revenues. And at $200,000, it would have to be a project that would come to you for approval first. So we would have to make sure that the funding is available, whether it's airport generated, FAA supported, local, state funded. So there's all sorts of um, opportunities. So it wouldn't go forward unless we found, identified the funding and also brought it to the council for adopt, for approval of the contract for the work or even contract for planning of the work. I got you, I, I understand that it has to come back forward. My question, I mean, it's in front of us now, that's why I'm digging in and you answered my most pertinent question about the general fund. So that, that answers that to that level. And the last thing to point out is, um, just wanted to point out on page 203 that the um, one of those numbers that was uh, that's been trued up down to the vehicle replacement plan down to 3.389, and I guess it was more of a typo from before when it was listed at five million. So, right, I believe that had been original placeholder, and so yeah, this is the yeah the Titan number. And thank you, Councilor Starbuck. Yeah. The last item that I have a little concern with here would be on page 201, the bottom of the Enterprises River Park uh, Campground, where we have a re reservation and payment kiosk. We're looking at sixty thousand dollars out of that enterprise to put a payment kiosk for what twenty-five spots or something in there, Mr. Mayor because I own property close to where this kiosk is, I've got to step out of the room. Okay, go ahead. Okay. If I knew it was that easy. <laughs> so, so anyhow, on with my, my thing here, $60,000 seems like a lot for an electronic ranger when we already have a, a camp host, we have rangers, and I, I go out there to that park and I look and I'm going, you know, when we have a big event, we require people that are renting the park to use our restrooms. We haven't been able to find the funds to repair the bathrooms. Uh, the road's horrible, you need a four wheel drive. The American Legion cabana in the very back has never had the power hooked up to it. Uh, the walking trail is, I'm gonna just say that for schools to use it as a track meet, it's kind of a jumping and hopping trail now and the grass is gone. I, I just, $60,000 to put an electronic ranger up versus $60,000 to make at least one improvement, preferably the restrooms out there, would seem like a lot better use of $60,000. Um, I agree with you to a certain degree. Um, currently, we're on par to make a quarter of a million dollars in revenue from the campgrounds, and we are having issues uh, because um, of the cash handling that takes place from the customer to the ranger to turning it into um, the office and then actually turning the money into here at City Hall. So the Iron Ranger would tighten up a little bit of the procedures and the opportunities for monies to go missing. Um, people claiming that I put my check in the ranger, uh, it's there, I put the cash in there, it's there. Um, it it kind of takes some of that away from from the equation. 
and again, we're generating about a quarter of a million dollars a year, so uh, that's something that I think would be a nice investment. Well, like you say, it'd be a nice investment, but I mean, if we can't keep a pedigree on a $10 parking or camping spot, it, it, you know, I mean, you're just to me, it just seems like $60,000 for, so we can eliminate one of the cash handlers. Obviously, we're not gonna need camp host. The, the bathrooms aren't gonna work. The showers are always in some type of issue. Um, we want to keep campers there. We need to make the camping area nice. And well, I, I don't know. I just, to me, it just seemed like an, an subordinate amount of money to put for somebody to drive up and put in when we have the Iron Ranger, we, we're paying a Ranger, we're, we're giving space to a, to a host, and we're not offering the amenities that we could be with it. So I, I really, I don't know. Okay, so Ms. Doubles, where do you want us to go on this? I just need you guys to affirm if this is what you're okay with. Okay, and or what we're doing is this entire package. We're not doing individual items on here, so. Yeah, this whole eight page. Correct. So, so do we have an agreement that the eight pages. We need to get Mr. Mosby back in the room. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Council Member Volsby, we're looking at an, an up or a down on the entire eight page document here. So I'll need three people to agree on the entire eight page document. Agree or disagree? I'm gonna agree with it. I hope that staff would take a lot of the input that was given you know, by the council. Um, we, we know that this is a fluid document. It's, it's out there for guideline. These are proposed. So, I mean, there's nothing in concrete that says that this is absolutely going to happen. We do our review in March. We'll probably go through it again. So, I mean, to me, just to move the budget process forward and to conclude it, I would like to go ahead and approve. I, I concur. I think, uh, I think it's a good thing to move forward. And, and you guys did ask for a lot of clarification, which I think everything just about has to come back to us anyway. So That's true. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a second. And we have a third. I'll give it a third. Okay. We got it. Okay, and with that, so that we can memorialize it with a vote that is recorded by the clerk, what you would now be doing to summarize all the actions that you've given me your majority uh, indication on is that now all equity adjustments are going to be removed from the uh, budget rather than just the general funded ones. Uh, you're approving the four added positions that we discussed and the eight pages of capital outlays. Okay. So now realize that we may not all agree on all these items, but we're, va we're voting on the entire package here, uh, yes or no. And just for clarification, I did get public comment on this item, did I not? You did. Okay, good. Okay, so I need a motion. Mr. Mosby. I move forward the motion as the city manager's diagram. And I need a second. I'll second. Any discussion? Let's vote. You got it. Five zero. Thank you. Okay. Now. Yeah. Well, let's see. We've got to do the written communications first. Written communications? Nothing more than you've already received. Okay. Now we'll move on to item number four. Mr. Garcia, item number four. And Councilmember Mosby, you pulled this. Is there anything specifically you'd like them to discuss? Um, I guess the reason for pulling is because I, I really don't believe that it raises our fully um, on a consent item and, and their, their customary and should be on a consent item. But likewise as well, since I believe these are all except for uh, a title change of one of the positions, there are four positions in here that are general fund positions. 
Uh, yes, that's correct. And since we have, and, and granted these are more related, not as equity, but these are uh, positions that are impacted. I believe that since we've suspended other equities, other, other pay increases, the, now these, these positions already had the same equivalent IBEW bumps in them? They did have the $125 per month, which was IBW, MS, and CN unwrap. And I, I believe that as we suspended other equities, again, being equitable, that these should be suspended, not cancels, but suspended. And as the budget comes back again to us, and we see that, that we have money to pay for these, I mean, we just had some huge uh, raises across the police department that you know, whether these are the first positions that we approve when we, when we come back with the new revenues and such, or updated revenues through the budget, but I, that's, you know, that's my reason for, for pulling it and believing that those four positions should be suspended. And I believe the other item was just um, a crossover and a title change. That's correct, it's a title so change. I didn't have any difficulty with that one because there's no, no increases in, in pay. There was no increase, it's, uh, it's, a, it's replacing the um, administrative analyst with the same salary schedule. Anyone else? Public comment. Oops, you are. Public comment. Seeing no one, no one rise, we're going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. Councilmember Starbuck. I guess my question is I understand what Councilmember Mosby says. I, I do have to agree that we're all of a sudden, we've given raises and we're doing additionals and we're trying to avoid compaction and all this other stuff here, but when do we intend to go back and look at this to see what our revenues are? Obviously in March, we're not gonna have a clear picture of what our revenues are and with what our budget that we approved is. Um, how long do we want to suspend these equity pays and, you know, the positions here? This would probably be more counsel amongst ourselves, you know, I just, I believe you asked during the budget cycle to bring it back after six months for discussion to see where we are. So I think uh, analysis in, in March, March would be able to see the, the numbers that are coming through. And at that time, I believe staff could bring back um, and see, because I know Mr. Wilkie would, would probably have some numbers by March, right? Would you have December's to be able to that's the hope with the new finance system. That's what we're aiming for. Um, that's predicated on being able to get the tonight's adopted budget that was adopted a couple months ago into the new system because right now we were not able to put any budget in the new system because it was in a flux. So we have to do that and then also balance out the July, August, September activity as an old system. So. Assuming that all goes well and goes uh, as we expect, then by March we should have a, a good feeling for what the first half of the year results are. And I think at that time the staff could bring back, we've, we've got 140,000 in equities suspended already, about 90,000 of our general fund, and then we have uh, approximately 38,000 that's in here and I think at that time we could bring back and, and make a movement forward at that time, but I, it's my recommendation. Yeah. I, I will concur with that. March would be a great time to review it while we review the budget then. Um, I'll please. give them a third also. Okay. Well, we're gonna vote on this one, so I just need a second. Um, were, these posi or were these raises, were they instituted? Were, I mean, we're not, taking something away right now? Um, no, what ends up happening is these are compaction that has to do with subordinate positions. So the city's um, practice is to have a 15 to 20% differential between subordinate positions and these have fallen um, under that by quite a bit with the action that we took when we, um, when we um, agreed on the MOU for the POA. So that's, this is, um, one of the byproducts of what happens with that increase. So you have supervisors 
um, their subordinates, um, the differentials have shrunk quite a bit. So that's what, that's what that's doing there. And also um, exhibit A, the police officer trainee, because it's not a union represented position, that, that was not uh, adjusted either. Be, you know, and so that's usually what we do is we keep that within 80% of the police officer so that when we're going in to hire the trainee, um, that's, been, that's been our past practice to keep it that way so that we're competitive and we're able to attract trainees that are in the academy. So that's why Exhibit A is there as well. You know, <clears throat> my feeling is, I, I understand the positions, but my feeling is that we are still having trouble recruiting public safety. We're still having trouble recruiting these trainees. We, we, I know Pat, um, Chief Walsh is always trying to get us, well, I think he tries for a, a local candidate and the best candidate. And if we're not competitive, we're not going to get either. Um, so I disagree with not going forward with this. So I will be voting no on this. But any other comments? Yes, Mr. Mosby. Again, the, the rationale about this is if we're asking other people to suspend them, I believe that we need to do the same. And as we bring back, this is a general fund, um, $38,000 expense. This is four positions that get 9% raise, which did already get the same as the IBEW union raises. And one of the positions has a 6% on top of the 9%. Mm -hmm. So I believe that these items can't come back and being equitable. I think it's important that we, we treat that level of equity across and with review in March, Everything going as, as what's going right now, we, we should be able to move forward within that time, but I think that's, it's important to be prudent in our moves. Well, I hope you're right. Okay, anything else? Let's vote. And that's three, two. Okay, that goes forward. Okay, and now we're gonna move on to item number six. Can handle this, Mr. Mr. Panoni. Was there a question? Yeah, I'll just be simple. In in what in, in I, I thank you for going through this. I know it was a, a lengthy process, and I think you came to some great conclusions. Opened up my eyes. I thought we still had the two million dollar emergency set aside, but in the near future, I will be um, making a council request that we try to get something that was kind of like what we had in '94 that we can have some sort of uh, rainy day fund. I'd made comments over the past several years about this um, and in coming up and seeing what we have now, um, it, it's led me to another path to try to get something designed to get us a more solid rainy day fund. So I, the way it was going, I just wanted to make the comment on that. Nobody was trying to pick on somebody, was trying to see where we we're going. And I know you had a, a deep level analysis to get through that. So I simply wanted to um, elaborate a little bit more than just at that time on comment. Anyone else? Public comment? Seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment, bring it back to the council. Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. And do we have a second? I'll second. Uh, any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5-0. Mr. Mayor, if I might, going back to number four just momentarily, I just want to make sure that the clerk and I both understood the same way what happened with the motion. The motion was to accept the change of title, but to decline any of the salary adjustments, and therefore we'll bring back the master fee schedule at a future meeting to reflect those changes. Yes, I probably didn't elaborate more. Thank but you. Yes. Okay, um, oral communication. This is your last opportunity to speak to us for up to two minutes on any item that can come before this council. Seeing no one rise, we're gonna close oral communication. So the council requests comments and meeting reports. Councilmember Mosby. It represented uh, last week, last Thursday, the city of Lompoc at the Santa Barbara County Association Governance Meeting. Councilmember Starbuck. I have no reports. Any hunting stories? <laughs> Not good ones. Okay. <laughs> okay, Councilmember Vega. Nothing to report. Councilmember Osborne. Um, I attended the Veterans Memorial Service uh, 
on Saturday, Veterans Day. I attended the economic forecast report for Northern Santa Barbara County. I attended the Econ Alliance Future Forum and then also the North County Rape Crisis Fundraiser representing the city. And I would like to announce that I am part of my commitment was to keep office hours and I have finalized a schedule and it will also be listed on the city website, but those will be Monday afternoons from one to five and Thursday mornings from nine to one and that will start on uh, November the 27th, Monday the November 27th. You can either drop in, check in at the front desk and they will buzz back to the office or make an appointment. And for those of you who haven't looked at the city website or looked it up, my city cell phone number is 805-315-8761. Thank you. And I may suggest you occasionally you may ask for Lompoc Record to put it in their corner. They may be able to do that for you. Okay, on uh, the 9th, November 9th, I attended a veterans assessment in Solvang in the morning. In the afternoon, I went back to Solvang, attended a economic alliance meeting, also in Solvang there. On the 11th, I attended the, um, oh, opening, I did opening remark, uh, remarks for the uh, Veterans Day program, which uh, Councilman Osborne mentioned she was there, also Councilman Vega, Councilmember Mosby were also, was also there. I think you were out of town. So we, we had a good representation from the, uh, the entire council at the uh, Veterans Day program at the Veterans Memorial Building. On the 17th, I spoke bef at a luncheon before the Republican Women's Club. And on the 18th, I did uh, opening remarks for the youth basketball here in town. A great bunch of kids. There was, I don't know, easily over 100 kids there ready to play basketball. And if there's nothing else, this council meeting or this council is adjourned to a regularly scheduled meeting at 6.30 p.m. on December 5th. Thank you all for attending and good night.